an outlet for my own expression. Um, what I've noticed working with my students is that, that if we think about music through the eyes and ears of the composer, it helps us understand their music better. So I'm going to put this out there. And I know that most of you are pianists. We have a few guitarists. Are there any other instruments that I've missed in this bunch, in this group? Violin too. Wonderful. So this does apply to all of you. I can guarantee you that 90% or more of what your teachers are telling you right now in lessons is already on the page in front of you. And you would give them a very nice challenge, which doesn't mean that you're a bad student, it means you're a very good student. It would be a good challenge, and I think they would appreciate it. If you would look at your music very closely, even before you play it, and you go, what else is on the page? Let me look at everything, every line of text, every articulation. What's our articulation? Anyone? No. So articulation might be staccato or legato, for instance, right? So we know when we see those markings in the, in the music, right? What does a staccato look like? Yes. A dot. A dot, right? But not to the side of the note, because that makes the note longer, like a dotted half note, but above or below it, right? And then if you have a phrase mark, if you're a violinist, I might tell you that you're playing all those notes on one bow. On piano means that you're connecting those notes, correct? But there might be something that says cantabile or allegro. I know, confusing. But look, when I was growing up, we didn't have internet. I didn't get to use my phone and just say, okay, what does this word mean? But you can do that with your parents. You can do that on your own if you're a little bit older. You can find out everything that's on the page, the pedal markings, and then you can come to your lesson and tell your teacher, hey, I noticed this. Can you explain it to me? Um, and that would really, really be great. What I noticed when my students learn to compose is because they have to put everything on the paper, they start noticing more. Because sometimes you, you see the notes, you know exactly what they are, but then you have to go, okay, what is this rhythm that I'm playing? How do I write a note? Does the stem go up or does the stem go down? Does it go up at the right side or up on the left side or down on the right side or down on the left side? Those are all very interesting questions, right? Are you with me so far? Okay, so I have this project and it's gonna be a big part of what we talked about today called 100 Solos for Piano Prodigies. These are pieces that I wrote in the last seven years. Over 100 pieces, and they're all written for students. They were written for my students. So they are student tested and student approved, but mainly student inspired. And why? Because when I was growing up, my teachers didn't use paper piano adventures. Very sad. They used uh, some really beautiful classical pieces, but it didn't have any pictures or didn't have any stories. And I loved reading books, um, but I didn't really think of my music as anything like a book. It was just I was making pretty sounds, but not necessarily that I was telling a story through music. And the older I get, the more I feel that we are telling stories. Any piece of music, even if it is a minuet or a sonata or a sonatina, we're telling a story. We're communicating with our audience. And we have to create something, even if the composer didn't tell us what it is, right? Anyone agree, disagree? Can I have some head nods or have some head shakes? Kind of maybe. Okay, we'll, we'll get through that together. Um, so what I did with this project is 100 pieces, but there are also 100 cover art uh, and descriptions, creative descriptions. Just like when you pick up a book um, at the library or on your Kindle, there's something that says, once upon a time in a land far, far away, there was a purple dragon that breathed fire. And I was like, ooh, tell me more. I want to hear more about that, right? So that's kind of what's going on with these pieces. Today, for the most part, we're going to start off by talking about improvising. Improvising is a little bit different than composing. Does anyone know what the difference is? Improvising is when you come up with something on the spot while composing, you can spend some time. That was a beautiful definition. Did everyone hear that? Yes? So improvising is to make something up, and you're not necessarily thinking about remembering it or keeping it. You're just you're making it up, and then you're kind of letting it go, like the song from Frozen. That was probably before some of your time. Um, but uh, why, uh, why would we like to improvise? What, what might be enjoyable about that? Okay, I'll give you my answers, okay? And then in a little while, we'll try these out and see what you think. 
For me, it's about expression. It's about getting to explore my instrument. When I have a piece of music that was given to me, my job is to learn that piece of music as best as I can, the way the composer gave it to me, the way, let's say, if I'm taking lessons, my teacher's instructing me to do. When I'm improvising, I'm like, wow, I have 88 keys, and there's so many different infinite combinations that I can play them. What happens if I combine these two keys? What type of sound is it going to make? What happens if I combine those two keys? Sometimes, in fact, when my students make a mistake in their lessons, instead of going, oh, that was the wrong note, I go, hey, that was a really cool sound you made right there. You should remember that chord that you played by accident because you might want to use that sometime for, for an improvisation. Play it again. Write it down. You never know. Okay. Um, my third form is to paint a picture for sound, and I talked about that a little bit earlier, about the, the stories, the, the real-life stories that come from music. Um, and then for me, is to create a personal relationship with music and sound. It's not just, here's a piano, it is black and white keys, it is a box that it has as many parts as a car or more, which is really cool, but I essentially am pressing buttons, and people think that it's really cool that I press buttons that make sound. No. I am creating a relationship with music, and the piano is just the instrument of toys that allows that to, to um, communicate. Um, so let's jump to part two, where do I start? So I was thinking about how I began with, with composing, and a lot of it was just not being a good practicer, I have to admit. I was um, loving reading books, and sometimes I would come home from the library with a big stack of books, and I would sit down, and read the books, and my mom said, Elizabeth, you should be practicing. I'm like, okay, I am practicing. And I'm reading the book. And then Nancy Drew went to the underground dungeon. And then the bad guy's coming, chasing after her. And my mom's like, that's not a piece that your teacher gave you. Okay, let's take your book away and get back to practicing. But honestly speaking, that is how it started this desire to explore, express, and maybe procrastinate a little bit. Um, at some points later on in life, I found that improvisation was really useful for the moments in time that I was on stage in a concert. I'm like, wait a second, I forgot where I am in a piece. Has anyone had that happen that you're playing and you're like, wait, I have like a blackout moment? Anyone? Yeah. I have. It's usually what scares me in a performance, going out there. I'm like, what happens if I forget? Then what I'm going to do, is my teacher going to have to come out to rescue me? Or now that I don't have a teacher, how am I going to rescue myself? And of course, now I practice better. I think about all the different ways that I can prepare so I can know my piece inside and out and backwards and forwards and virtually upside down. Um, but improvisation ended up being something that helped me when I was younger. I would be like, okay, let me improvise for a few measures until I find my way back to where I was at. Anyone do that before? It would be an interesting experience. Let's say you would be playing through a recital piece and then someone taps you on the shoulder and then you have to stop playing and you have to make up your own music and then when they tap you again, you have to get back into the piece. I challenge you to try that. It's not easy, it's not easy, but it will give you a completely different sense of do I know my piece? Can I get distracted and get back into it? Just an idea. They're gonna be, you have a new music notebook. Yes, I am playing original songs. I love to hear that. So, what else is right here? I'm going to share, I think I've done a lot of talking, so I'm going to share a little bit of music with you, and then we'll continue on with a little bit of talking and exploration. Um, so everyone knows Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? Yeah. No. Yep. Did I hear no? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure. We, we got yeses, right? So... Most of you would say it's a very easy piece that you, ex you know, expect younger people to play. Maybe some of you are familiar with the Mozart's variations on that theme, and you're like, okay, those are complex, so that's a different story. But, you know, someone plays it, and, it's... and then eventually get, they get better, and they create a phrase, right? And then maybe they add some chords and some pedal. Or maybe they change the register. So 
really does sound like it's more of a twinkly star. And then I have a piece that I wrote, which maybe I'll have your pull up so you can see it just a little bit. I call it Once Upon a Twinkle. And this is one of the first pieces I wrote for my students that, that kind of changes something that you know and turns it into something different. And that's one of my favorite things to do with music. Like if you were, um, if you had a piece that was ready to go, we might improvise a second piano part. It's what I call a duet of it. But I took Twinkle Twinkle, and if you look at the right hand, it looks like Twinkle. Right? But then listen to what I do with it. The first note, of the, the second note of the left hand, will already clue you in that something is different. Is that the way you expect to put the sound? Yeah. Yeah. Right, it's in the minor key. I'm taking a major piece, or one that we typically hear in major, and turning it into minor. If you know your cadence pattern in minor, one, four, four, five, seven, one. Does anyone, like Campus Show Camp, who's familiar with those chords? One, Five seven one or major one one five seven one. If you've made it up to favor to B, you have done these at some level, okay? But so I'm taking a minor chord and then I'm mixing it with major four, and this is what we get. And then I change that register. I bring the right hand up and off it. Surprises, they're kind of like little goodies when you least expect it. And then when you play for the audience, they're like, oh, it's gonna be twinkle. Oh wait, but it's different. Oh, but it's in the all the but it's not, it's different, right? So then we're telling the story, we're kind of casting the spell in our audience. And my hope is that in any piece of music that you're playing by any composer, you look for those little moments because they are there. And the more advanced you get, the more you start to notice them and can share them with your audience. Our audiences are kind of blind. In a way, when they're listening to us, and what I mean by that is they can see us, but they can't see the music normally, right? So they don't know what to listen for, and you don't sit there or stand there right before the performance and tell them all the things that they're going to experience. You have to just do it, and you have to do it in such a way that they're like, oh, yeah, that made perfect sense, even if it's the first time that they're ever hearing that piece of music. Interesting? Okay. So, a little bit more talk next. So one of the first things that I usually talk about with improvisation is elements or variables within music. Things that if we were say, I'm just going to focus on this one element of music um, that I could, for instance, if I play Twinkle Twinkle, what are the different ways I could change it without changing um, the accompaniment pattern? So if you are following along, it could be the dynamics, which would be, for instance, Dynamics. Oh, speak out louder. So loud would be forte, soft would be piano, and then we have the mezzos, and we have the isimos, and then there are other things that we can do with accents, right? So, for instance, what happens if I make a crescendo and then diminuendo, or let me do the opposite. Every other. Right? All these different. 
different variables are going to change the way that the music sounds, and these are all choices that we make as composers. So you have your articulations. I could do it all staccato or all legato. Or I can mix it up. Or right? And some of these would be considered more classical, and others would be kind of like, oh, you broke the rule right there, putting an accent at the end of the phrase, that was not so nice, but maybe it depends what the rest of the music is doing, right? Um, so then you have uh, texture. Um, so texture would be for me, melody plus melody and accompaniment uh, is the left hand playing just a block chord. Or is it breaking it? something that, you know, I wonder how many I could do if I just sat in here and counted them out, but we're not going to do that. But maybe you can do that when you go home and you come up with how many different ways can you play twinkle twinkle, even if you just do it the normal major way. Um, arrange, we talked about that, either up high, look how different it would be if it's down here. of some sort for twinkle you know the star went the wrong direction um but uh, ha have you ever taken a piece of music that you're playing and tried it in a different octave yeah. no. some yes. of you yes no. some no it's, no it's one way that i practice you know for instance if i have something that's very difficult i'll try it in its regular position and then i'll try an octave higher or an octave higher than that or an octave lower or transpose it to a completely different key like, I don't know, the first piece that I come to mind with for you guys would be, right? What happens if I brought it up? Or, did not practice that, so I'm going to leave it right there. But if you did that, you kind of start thinking about, does it sound different in different keys, or does it sound the same? And is it different just because it's higher or lower? Does each key have a different flavor? So let's do with twinkle. Let's go back to twinkle. Um, should it be major or minor? Minor. 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 Everyone's liking minor. <laughs> cool. We should do that too. So here is. But what happens if I do? Did you like version one better or version two? Version, version one. Two. Bad <laughs> mix. Okay, here's version one. Now I'm going to try C sharp minor. change it to D flat minor. Oh. Let me change it to B minor. Let's see what, what does it sound like in that. Okay. I've done that with pieces. I've written pieces and they're like, it's too easy. Let's change it to a different key that has six flats or six sharps or something like that. Ooh, now it's interesting. Now I'll give the student both versions. I'll give them the version that has no sharps or flats and I'll give them the version that has six flats. And they learn the one with none and then they learn with the six and look how easy it is now they know how that it goes. Right? You guys kind of following? Yeah. Catching on to some of this. Yeah, cool. So again, we can change rhythm, and it could be it could be something like. I know some of you who did Suzuki are thrilled with that, right? But what happens if I do? Too. 
I like that. I love music. You know that anyone out there who's like, oh, I don't like classical music. How many times have I heard that? I'm like, but you go to movies. And they're like, well, of course I go to movies. I'm like, do you realize how much classical music is in movies? How much uh, the, the music impacts the way that we feel what is happening in the, the you know, excitement or the sadness or anything along those lines. It's all based off of, uh, of this. Um, so an idea is take a piece that you already know, take an idea that you already know, and try just this kind of number one, try different dynamics, articulations, texture, ornamentation, rhythm, range, tempo, other. Does anyone have questions that you want me to go over? In fact, are there any questions at all so far? I love questions. I'm so sad. No questions? No. Complaints? Compliments. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Yes. Wait, if you make a variation of it, wouldn't it just be longer or yeah. shorter? Yeah, well, you know, there's such a form called theme and variations. Um, are you familiar with that? No. No? So it's basically, you would show the audience the theme, and you would play it in a normal way, and then you would write your variations. There might be just one variation, or there might be 20 variations, right? Um, so I encourage you to actually look at Mozart's version of this, which he doesn't call Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. There's a completely different name to it. But if you look at Mozart's Twinkle Star variations, it will still come up on YouTube. And you'll see what he does with it. Sounds good? Um, or, you know, if you've heard people, they do cover songs, right? So they're taking a song by another artist and then they're creating their own version of it. So you could basically have something that takes the same length of time and it's literally just a variation and doesn't have a theme. And if it's a theme that people know, then they don't even need to hear it as a theme because they'll recognize it right away. I didn't have to play Twinkle Twinkle for you normally. You would have gotten the reference just based off of enough of the clues that are in the music, I think. Okay? What's that? A remix. A remix. That's a great way of putting it. Thank you for updating my vocabulary. I needed that. So um, the second point that I came up with is to explore scale. So let's go through these scales and see if we can cover them in terms of what they mean. What is it? Someone called this out earlier. What is a pentatonic scale? Penta. Yes. I I I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. But I appreciate you answering. Um, so how about if I say a pentagon? How many sides does it have? Any idea? Five. It is. Yeah. So pentas, uh, pentatonic scale has has five notes in it. On the piano, it's the easiest one, even for my non-pianists in the mix, it's the easiest one to figure out because you could start off just by playing the black keys. Can I have you as a volunteer? Thank you, Zachary. Come and share the bench with me. So Zachary and I met about probably uh, 30 minutes ago. He has not volunteered officially. I just mandatorily brought him up here. Um, and the pentatonic scales can be these black keys. Let's do something super slow and dreamy. You can use both hands. You can use two notes at a time. You can use one note at a time. You can use just one hand at a time. I'm gonna play along with you. And that's about as much instruction as I'm gonna give him. On my end, I'm going to be embellishing with some additional harmony. So I'll be using white keys as well. Um, and we're just gonna do about 30 seconds. You're gonna to have to just trust me. Exactly. Yep. So but these are the black keys, and I'll explain how we can do it for a more advanced version. Yeah. So.
So now if we've practiced it and like, okay, let's actually talk about what we're doing here, then there'll be more options that we could really try to unite our ideas. But pentatonic scale is pretty forgiving. Um, here's the thing, the easiest way to do the last piece that if I would take a dance student like Vicky, I would say, well, could you, and we'll say something else for you, can you do yeah. it in the white piece? Well, if you slide everything up a half step, B, E, G, A, D, or of notes can be transposed into another key and the best way for you to get to your instrument is try things in other keys in any key yes question from olivia i feel like it's for the end i feel like that was for the end of the movie no oh, i like that that's a huge compliment to you oh okay yeah. <laughs> okay um oh, while there's zachary up here so yeah, who knows what a chromatic scale is this. who has played a chromatic scale in their pieces can you explain what it is me yeah uh you just Progress by semitone. By semitone, by half step. And then the piano, that would be, you know, literally the keys are adjacent to each other. Zachary, have you done a chromatic scale at all? Maybe. Right? So it's... Sometimes. Sometimes. You know, I would advise you guys to do the following. Everyone who's a pianist, practice your chromatic scale right hand from the bottom to the top and time it. Right hand from the top to the bottom and time it. Left hand from the bottom to the top and time it. And left hand from the top to the bottom and time it. Actually, Zach, I'm going to say thank you so much. I'm going to demonstrate that and let you take your seat back again. Okay. Okay? So, thank you, Zachary. Okay. So, that would go something like this. So, that was probably about eight and a half seconds, not my best, but, but pretty quick, right? Um, and you get better and better by doing it. Tip, all the time when you hear like curve your fingers or keep your hands in a relaxed and rounded position, that helps so much for something like that because if you're playing with flat fingers, it's like trying to run a race with straight feet. You're not going to get ahead of anyone that way, right? But this rounded position allows your fingers to stay right where they need to be. You have a fingering that works very well for the chromatic scale that your teachers will work with you on. Um, and it's great for agility as well as obviously making sure that all the keys in the piano work and success. This piano is excellent. Two thumbs up. Um, so the, the reason I wrote the chromatic scale is it literally uses all the colors of the keyboard. So I could take twinkle twinkle. Adventure of the Planets for you. Oh. 
Because it uses a couple of the things that we've already talked about. So that's the cover, that's your description, specific skills to work on. And then this is certainly for a student of mine who was eight years old. So she had pretty small hands. She couldn't reach an octave, right? So instead of giving her octaves, I gave her what's called a broken octave. So I'm using, you'll see those grace notes. You see the grace notes in the right hand? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it is, does anyone know what key we're in here? C sharp minor. Bravo! That's exactly right. Yeah. I, but you know, if you had said E major, it would have given you some credit for that, for sure. But I'm really glad that you looked for context here. So it is in C sharp minor. Um, and you'll notice that for the most part, the left hand is only really using the C sharp minor chord with an added sixth, which gives us a very dreamy sound. huge fan of yours. I've heard this piece a thousand times, but right now everyone in this room has only heard this once. So I'm like, well, let me play it again an octave lower. Help the audience hear the music that's being sections really comments streaking through tonight there are only two chords in the section it's going to sound like a lot more but we have these two chords and really it's only the bottom two notes that are changing we have a and c sharp changing to the g sharp and b sharp in the second measure okay that's about as much as you need to know this is what it sounds like Music goes to like it doesn't quite sound like the end, but it is the end. 
Cool. Yeah. It's kind of like something you would hear maybe in a planetarium or if you go to the aquarium. It's meant to kind of like grab your imagination and take the audience on a journey through music, which is cool. Okay. So we talked about pentatonic chromatic holotone and everyone can define it for their folks at home. Pentatonic has how many notes? Yeah, I need to hear everyone say that. Five. Five. And chromatic uses all what type of steps? It has all 12 notes, so it's all semitones or half steps, yes? And a whole tune scale uses all six, six notes, yep, yeah. and you find them by going up by half steps or whole steps. Whole steps, whole tone, whole steps. We're good? And so you can find a whole tone scale with the C, D, E, and then the black keys, but you can also transpose it. Right? So you can hear it's the same colors or the same concept, them moving it into different places. And then, of course, you have major and minor scales, which are probably the ones you're most familiar with because we use those right from the very beginning of our music lessons. Does that sound right? Like C major position or minor or D minor? Some yeses in the mix? Yeah, I think so. So let's, if you are following along, you can take a quick look at page two, where I gave you the idea of explore some short, simple, familiar tunes by ear. So this is all what I consider ear training or musical training that uses improvisation and uses composition, but really just trains your abilities to combine what you're learning in lessons and theory um, with some creativity. So I would start with any of these. Uh, I wrote down the ones that I think are the easiest at the beginning, Hot Cross Buns, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, side note, my parents have a farm in Pennsylvania that I just wrote down from. They have a baby lamb that was abandoned by its mom. Very sad, except very happy because I get to bottle feed it and it follows me everywhere. So, so it gives me new meaning to that little tune. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes if you're happy and you know it, happy birthday. I did also write down which scale degree it starts on because I tell you every time I ask someone, hey, can you play happy birthday in the key of C? 99% of the time they start on C. And guess what? Happy birthday does not begin on the tonic. Who's familiar with the word tonic? And if you're not, it's okay. All The main reason I'm saying all these crazy things is even though for some of you it's in the next book or two books away, is so that when Miss Irene or Mr. Yarl or your teacher tells you about this, you're like, oh, I remember that presentation. It actually is important to know what a tonic or a dominant or subdominant is because it's gonna help you with improvisation and composition. Does that make sense? Right, so it's okay if you don't understand it right now. Just pay attention because it will be coming up really soon for a lot of you. Um, so you're using, for those of you who do know, uh, I did write this scale degree that it starts on. For instance, hot cross buns starts on the third degree of the scale. So if you're in C major, starting on a third note of C major is E. Good. If you're in F major, you're starting on a Good. If you're if you're in G major, you're starting on a. Okay. See, everyone's getting it. Or for instance, head, shoulders, knees, and toes starts in the fifth scale degree. So you're, if you're in F major, then you're starting on. Yeah. Good. If you're in G major, starting on. Yeah. yeah if you are in E major. Uh, Good. That's perfect, right? So this will help you. And then uh, the first one, how cross button only uses the one and five seven chords if you're doing traditional harmony. So for instance, hot cross buns, what, what key should I try it in? C. And C? Okay. So my first note's gonna be E. And I'm harmonizing fourth and key C. So here in the left hand, the one and the five seven chords, right? And again, if you need more of a definition, ask your teacher in next lesson those two chords. And you're like, okay, that's nice enough. It's very simple. It works. What else can I do with it? Well, you can do broken chords, you know, I could block the chords one note at a time. I could do a double as fast Alberti bass. Do some chord jumps.
You have the melody, melody and the chords, and then you can create variations. Um, maybe, maybe instead of the left hand being fancy, the right hand is fancy. Right? You know, Olivia didn't like that. How about if I make it more? who is on the faculty of Peabody. This is actually one of the exercises he gives his students. He says, make folk tunes, play it by ear, and transpose it to every key so that you are not obstructed to by your bow crossings or by shifts or which keys are comfortable or not, but that you're able to do this in any given key. Okay? Questions? So there is one scale that we skipped, and I was just thinking about that. It's the blue scale. Is anyone familiar with that? No. no. Yes? Uh, yeah. It's like, it's like... You can either demonstrate it, you can yeah, sit in yeah, it. Yeah, you want to demonstrate? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. exactly it. Transposition into plays, and we're going to do a little. There's someone here. Can you try it on C? Yeah. Can I help you through it if you need help? Easiest 
progressions to improvise in is 12 bar blues, blues form. Again, that could be another workshop or an entire course. But I'm gonna show you a couple things that we can do with it. And remind me one more time. So Andy is gonna be my very capable volunteer. I'm gonna get cue him as we go through it. I'm gonna have him improvise either on the C, F, or G blues scale as I come up with some left hand accompaniment patterns. Then I'll show you what I might do with it, and I'll show you a piece of music that uses it as well. Sounds good? Yeah. And he's like, I should not have volunteered. I'm so volunteering. Yes, he is. He is, is being on the spot, but I'm, I'm proud of you and, and already excited. So we're going to start with C. I'll be in charge of all the accompaniment pattern. All you can do is take notes that are C. You can go up or down. So for instance, notice that I use the B flat here instead of going up. Can do single note rhythm. So it's going in. You can, of course, absolutely. so little to go off of, but amazed because you're just like fearlessly diving into it, trusting your instincts, going within the parameters that we have. And again, um, it's, it's, it's fun. Now, let's say Andy decided to do it on its own, on its own, <laughs> sorry, on his own, he might say, okay, I'm going to do the left hand. is a really fun, easy way. And if you have a teacher who might do the left hand part for you, then it's really fun to improvise in that. Big round of applause for Andy. <laughs> Dizzy Town. Dizzy Town. Disney. <laughs> without the end, without the end, I couldn't use Disney because they would sue me. Are you kidding? <laughs> Dizzy. Dizzy Town. Oh. Yeah, I like the cover for this. That was uh, kind of fun. I thought, I thought you said <laughs> so, Disney. Okay, look, we'll read it. You, you know that feeling when you spin in circles and stop, but the world keeps spinning around you? You might try to walk away and pretend that you're not dizzy, but you can feel that you're swaying left and right. While the residents of Dizzy Town have this feeling all the time, as their little town is constantly spinning. But they quite like it, in fact. They have learned to dance to it, and they are inviting you and your audience to join them. So that's what Dizzy Town is, and it has a blues mm -hmm. scale, especially you'll hear that on the second page. We'll go through. <clears throat> this is about an intermediate level of blues. the 
everything that's changing. So again, it's compositional tactic. So if you have a friend who plays violin and cello, or even just violin, there's a version for that, you have an easy duet. And the piano part does not change. Oh. So if you learn the piano part and you gotta get a friend to play along with you, you don't have to do anything extra. All they have to do is learn their parts and it matches into it. So one of my favorite little pieces question from one of my favorite front row people, amongst many favorite front row people, of course. Yes. It sounded like a very intense movie. Like a what type of movie? Intense. Intense. Like in a mysterious way, right? Almost like spy or something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, again, I want to open up to questions before I continue on. Is there anything that is on your mind right now that you have a question about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was on your mind. That was a valid question. Oh, yeah. Any other, do we need a break? Do we need like a quick stretch break? Uh, I know that you allowed the time for an hour and a half. You guys are good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they're good. Do you want me to play some more of my music for a little while? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll do that. I'm gonna tell you about the, the next segments after we take a playing break. Um, so we have a lot of pieces to choose from. Let me do Conger River Journey. Um, just so you guys know, all of the pieces were, were named by actual students. I didn't name any of them. I would write the piece and then I would have a student come up with a name for it. Um, and of course, I had veto power, which means that I could say no if, I, if they're like, it's a fluffy bunny, uh, something, something. I'd be like, mm, no, no. no. <laughs> well, we, we can come up with something better than uh, improved. So Congo River Journey is interesting because I didn't know anything about the Congo River. But the student who I was working with told me that it was a unit of study in his, his uh, third grade class. And he was telling me about this amazing river and I read about it and found out that it's actually the world's deepest river. And I started watching videos of it on YouTube, learning about the people and the nations that it goes through. And I was like, I hope that students who play this piece will be inspired to learn about this river as they play this piece. In a lot of the pieces, the, 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 uh, the pieces that are named after actual animals or places in the world are meant to do that because I want you guys to be curious, not just about music, but about everything. It's very important as a musician and a human being. Question here. Do you, did you write any words for any of your songs? That's a fantastic question. There are some unofficial words, but nothing that ha uh, has words in this collection. I have written songs. There's a whole, what's called a song cycle. It's five pieces that are meant to go together. Um, and all five of those have words because they're meant to be sung. Um, but um, most of these ones don't have words. And I'll explain part of why that is, if you'd like. Why? <laughs> well, well, I've always been a little bit jealous of everyone who does the, the you know, the, the music that everyone knows. 
I'm playing a piece by Taylor Swift. I'm playing a piece by Lady Gaga. I'm playing, I'm like, that's really cool. But do we, isn't it, isn't this musical too, isn't some of the music you come up with or play really cool too? Can't we sway audiences just based on the music, not just on the lyrics and maybe even do more with it? So it's kind of my little way of making our music really fun and exciting, but with what we do and not looking to outside sources to add on to it in a nutshell. Oh. But if you choose to put words to it and want to send them to me, I would be delighted. An idea. So Conquer River Journey, um, this key, so what key is it in? I'm going to give you the first chord. So combined with the key signature, can anyone figure it out? Uh, e minor. I heard E minor. minor. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. It, um, who's familiar with relative major, relative minor? So I, I need a show of hands. Who does not know what relative major, relative minor means? Raise your hand. Uh, loud and like proud. Like I have no idea what that means. Please help me. Thank you. Okay. So let's take a teaching moment here. If you've seen the circle of fifths, some of you may have. It might be floating around in a poster somewhere around here. It's basically like a clock, and a clock has 12 numbers on it. You have 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 3 o'clock, and all the others and around it. Well, the circle of fifths has 12 key signatures, sharps on one side, flats on the other. Um, and each one basically unlocks what that key signature is. If you see one sharp, and it's a major key, you would know it's G major. But every major key has a secret or not so secret relative minor. And they're really easy to find. You go down three half steps. Some of you guys know that, right? So C major, go down three half steps. B, B flat, what did I just land on? A. A. So C major, no sharps or flats. A minor, in the key signature, no sharps or flats. G major has an F sharp. It's the it's the first one to the right of C major in the circle of fifths. Now we go down three half steps. G, F sharp, F, and now I'm landing on E. e. Okay, and E minor in the natural form is the same as G major for, for the key signature. So that gives you a little clue about that, right? You can think about them as cousins or secret twins or something along those lines. They share a key signature. So um, this piece, Conquer River Journey, you'll hear a chord pattern, E minor to C major to G major to D major, which is very much a pop harmony. A lot of pop songs use that. Minor one, major six, major three, D major. I'll just play it. But listen out for that re repetition through page one. Or E minor, bingo. That's my secret entry 
way back to the beginning of age. Gotta know those relationships to create form in music. Do something a tiny bit different here, just raising the right hand up an octave. Here I have makes it a little bit more wistful, or like we're floating into the distance. finish it just for the theory buffs in the audience there's no missing in this chord which is why it sounds unfinished if I finished it like this it would be like oh it's the end but I didn't give us the third of the chord it could have been major it could have been minor but by taking that third out it's kind of like to be continued yeah. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a mystery. Yeah, I like mysteries. Okay, so that was Ponga River Journey. Questions? No. Play more? Yeah. Do you, do you like it if I talk you through them? Is it helpful to kind of hear like the way that I'm hearing the music and what I was doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Discovery of Bird yeah. Island. I like that one. Discovery of Bird Island? Discovery of Bird Island. Bird Island. Bird Island. Look at all those birds. So actually, in South America, there were a couple places in Patagonia that we went to, and there were so many birds that the, the islands looked like they were just, you know, rocks, and then you get closer, and you're like, those are all birds. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 my God. Oh, oh, those are all yeah. birds. <laughs> so, um, this one, has anyone done canon exercises? I know you guys don't typically do them here, but you've heard of them, right? Like, <laughs> often use. Um, this is kind of in a weird way inspired by that. You'll hear it in the right hand and it requires the same control and facility. You have to use your arm to support your fingers. And again, this is something I'm sure your teachers work on you with. If you just lift your fingers, that's a lot of work for these tiny little muscles. But if you counterbalance with the use of your arm and your wrist, the sound is going to be a lot nicer. And it's a lot more comfortable for your hand because you're using your arm to play with it. Very often people are like, oh, you're a pianist. You, uh, you know, you have to be careful with your fingers or, or you know, you play with your fingers. I'm like, yes, I understand that, but I play with my whole body. You know, I play loud. The muscles are front, back, shoulders, legs, everything is part of the music making. But even if I'm doing something, let's go back to our little twinkle experiment. Notice that my hand position is always changing slightly. It's, if I did just the fingers, it would look like this. Do you see it? And some of you are laughing, you're like, yeah, that looks wrong. The verse is... Even that tiny bit of a distance, I'm like, okay, I'm going to help my pinky finger out by leaning slightly to it. If I go up an octave, I lean a little bit more. I go up an octave again, I lean a little bit more, right? If my hands have to slip, then I can't lean all the way to the right because my poor left hand. But, but we figure that out, right? It is the same with violin and with guitar and cello. You're finding ways to, to kind of surf your instrument, not just use your fingers. So all that to say in Discovery of Bird Island, you'll see that a lot on page one. The left hand, however, is pretty basic. It's a pattern, a broken chord, D minor, The bottom bit is changing that changes the filter of the sound for the top. same. 
think about this as a composer. I'm using the same harmony, but, but now I'm going to change the rhythmic groupings. I'm going to change the texture above it. Obviously, we don't want it to be up and down because the more we lift, the less connected it is. Yeah. Slur. Slur? Yeah, well, we try our, our journalists to just slur them. I would say expression is what creates that. If I play them all equally, then it's going to sound very chalky. But if I say I'm starting less and then more. Then I add the pedal to it, then you'll hear. Right? So then it, it, we're not concerned with each note, but we're thinking about what is being said in the musical sentence. Okay? Um, then you hear the theme, but it's kind of hidden. Listen. Here in number 29, even lower than the bass clip in the right hand. And then the second. Surprise. And that's kind of like our little clue that something's going to be different. We have the middle section that is very much modeled after Chopin. And then if you go all the way back to or down to measure 60, the theme comes back. It looks initially the same, but the left hand changes. The first one is, and then measure 68. So you can hear how that gives it a different flavor. And then 72. And then switch to measure 80. 
resolute. This is the same theme, completely different texture, uh, different dynamic. <laughs> and a snapshot. Should I play the whole thing or should we go to a different piece? Okay. Okay. Well, okay. It's not that long. It'll give you a little bit of chill time. Nocturne and F sharp minor. Listen out for the things that we talk about. When I have a volunteer to try to scroll for me, I'm not very good at figuring these things out. Yeah. You know what? Um, you want to come up, Olivia? So all you have to do is kind of like scroll. I'm going to put it a little bit off to the side so you can really see it on the side right now. You know what? Maybe it's like this. There we go. So when I nod my head vigorously, just press the down arrow. Yeah. Easy. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
of stage turns. The vast majority of the time you'll see me with regular printed music, just desperately flipping the pages because I've had every conceivable nightmare of an experience with the page turners. But Olivia, I will remember you for my next concert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it was kind of like a theme and variations built in with the middle section that was a deviation from it, right? Um, questions, anything? No, more music? Yeah. Pick yeah. something. Let's, let's take a look at the list. Let's see if I can find something interesting. That yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Can it be something loud? Something loud? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a few. I like Laura's magic mountain. Laura's magic mountain is it's interesting. It's good. Um, you know that piece that we did earlier? Actually, what's a pilot twinkle? And I used a little bit of In the Hall of the Mountain King. So I had a student who asked specifically for something that uses that. So this is, this is again, the more you listen to music, so the more music you know, the more you're drawing from. So um, this is a session that is on composition and improvisation, but a little bit of technique, and a lot on ways to think about music. I don't know if you can tell that I'm secretly adding all those little vitamins in there. Um, but one thing I want to encourage everyone here is listen to a lot of music. Obviously, a lot of different composers of really great works from all time periods. And a lot of piano music, but what about symphonic music, symphonies, and ooh, operas? And, and I saw a couple of you go, opera? No, don't bash it till you try it. Listen to some opera, listen to some Mozart operas, they're funny. Um, listen to some string quartets, listen to some a song cycles by Schubert. Listen, listen, listen. It's like one of the best things you can do for yourself as a budding musician and composer, your brain works in interesting ways, right? We don't always know how does it work, you know, when we're speaking. I didn't know what exactly every word I would say when I came in here, but it's inspired by the moment and it's inspired by experience. In the same way, the way that we compose, the way we improvise is inspired by the moment, but it's also inspired by experience. Things that we've heard somehow digested, somehow as part of us, along with some knowledge of theory or form, and it all comes together and you're like, oh, I really like that idea. That's going to inspire me to do something else. So one of the best things you can do is listen to a lot of really good performances. And it's easier and cheaper, a.k.a. free, to do than ever before in history. So no excuses. So we have a little bit of Merlin's Magic Mountain that we'll try just so you can hear kind of like this concept of... Fred. Oh, oh, I, I love him. Oh, we have to do Fred. Oh, we totally have to do Fred. So we'll do Fara Edi, aka Fred, after this. But Merlin's Magic Mountain, this, this is based off of the Hall of the Mountain King. I think my right hand did not get too low. It is. Let's reset that. Um, but while we reset, just notice that my left hand is playing on mainly beats what? Look at the music. It's playing a beat one, but mainly on beats two and four, correct, which is going to give, give it a little bit of a excitement rhythmically. If I did, it's on every beat. If I do it in one and three, it would sound like this. But now if I do it one and then mainly on two and four, one, three, changing everything. Okay? So that gives you a little bit of sense of Merlin's Magic Mountain. So I'm going to call it a Farah Edie, 
aka Fred. It actually was written for a student named Fred, um, and it's his name in music. Who can figure out how that works? So F is easy enough. E is E is enough, and so is D. How, who knows how I made R work? Uh, you uh, you use A two times. That's a good guess. It is. One more. Um, F and E. That's a good guess as well. So who has heard the song Joe would you hear a female down? And then Ray. Solfege, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, at some point, uh, right? Yeah. And in solfege, they actually have names for the sharps and flat notes. So C is do, C sharp is D, but it's spelled like D I, not not D. D. Uh, re, re, mi, fa, mi, so C. Okay. If I go flat, re turns to ra. D flat is ra. So. F, Ra, E, D, Fred. And the whole first page uses that. First, just those notes. And then I use those C notes really fast. Then I add some fifths in the left hand. Then change our harmony in left hand.
Yeah. yeah. And I will be here if you have questions or comments, feel free to come up. What do you guys say? Thank you.